fire outside. One of the joys of being out in the boonies is you can cook outside over an open fire and listen to the cows moo because that's how we roll. I'm, I would never turn down some more. Yeah, I'm, there's a fire there. I mean, we, we voted on it. It would pass like handily. So, yes, we can do some more. There you go. So, Emily with a solid suggestion right there. Well done. Well done. Yeah. There you go. That's a good idea. Good. Because you're going to do it. No. <laughs> and then, and so... I know I, I chuckled when I did this slide. It says dress casually, which is kind of what we do every week. That just means when I'm wearing jeans next week, nobody should freak out, <laughs> right? I'm like, I, I'm laughing. I'm like, dress casual is kind of like the uniform of the day around this joint. So, And then uh, on November 1st, Corey and Don Beebe will be here. They are missionaries to Spain and Andorra. Looking forward to that. How are we doing? Are we good? We always love to have Marilyn sing, don't we? Amen. All right. And we've got her all mic'd up. And just do your thing. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm to the hand. I commit again with all I am in you, Lord. You hold my world in the palm of your hand, and I am.
Jesus, I believe, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong, I belong to you. And you're the reason I live, you're the reason I sing. Cause oh, all I can. Unto your hands. I commit again with all I am to you, Lord. You hold my robe in the palm of your hand, and I am yours forever. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I belong, I belong to you. You're the reason I live, you're the reason I see, cause oh, all I am. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. I mean, he knows you got to say, I believe sometimes when it doesn't make any sense to believe. You kind of look at the situation and go, I believe regardless of the situation. Amen. Um, give me a give me slide there. Ah, there we go. Mark chapter uh, 11 uh, is where we're going to go today. And... Uh, and uh, the Lord kind of, the Lord does interesting things when we put these things together. Uh, I was sure I was done with this on Thursday, right until the moment on yesterday when God goes, oh, put this last part on here. So here we go. <laughs> Mark chapter 11 and verse 12 goes like this. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went uh, to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was uh, not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat from fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Uh, I want to preach to you this morning on this topic. Uh, a tale of two trees, a tale of two trees. Uh, I am envious of people who have a green thumb. Uh, I do not have a green thumb. Charity has a green thumb. Charity put in a garden this year, uh, and it was a wonderful thing. Um, I'll read Darcy's Facebook post. She's got a green, well, Scott has a green thumb. Scott has, her husband has a fantastic green thumb. Uh, Mark has a green thumb. I've eaten out of his garden for the last six years, and I'm better for it, uh, <laughs> but I'm jealous of people who can grow stuff, right? Uh, if you're going to get me a plant, get me one of these, because that's about all I can grow, and that cactus is fake, so that's the best plant for me is one that's fake, because if it comes to me and it gets nurtured, uh, you all know me well enough to know that nurturing ain't my thing, so, uh, <laughs> so it's going to die. Um, so my thumb is not green, but uh, when we read the scriptures, Jesus spoke a lot about agriculture in his ministry. Uh, at the time uh, of Jesus, Israel was an agrarian society, and Jesus spoke to people in a way uh, that they could understand things. Uh, Matthew wrote this, he said, all these things Jesus spoke uh, to the multitude in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parable, and I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. 
So Matthew tells us that Jesus spoke things in parables. And the reason he did this was so that he could take complex things and make them understandable. Now, in my day job, one of the things I get to do is I'm an expert witness. So uh, when I'm acting as an expert witness and I'm talking to a jury, one of the things I'm trying to do is take complex ideas, uh, complex medical ideas and whatnot, and make these understandable and make the jury sympathize with me and understand where I'm coming from. And so that's what Jesus did, is he, he would take these complex spiritual ideas and he would speak in such a way that they were understandable. And so if you read through the Gospels, uh, all the time you're seeing Jesus say things like, the kingdom of heaven is like. You know, the kingdom of God is like, there was a man, right? So he's telling stories so that you can understand it. And so in Luke chapter 13, uh, Jesus uh, 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 shares a parable about a fig tree. But you've, you've got to see how this chapter starts. So in Luke chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, uh, There were present at that season some who told him, uh, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners uh, than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, here is a horrible story you don't want to share with your children, right? Right? So there's some dispute about what Jesus is actually talking about here in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 13. But here's kind of what I was able to glean from my research. There were a group of Galileans that had gone to the temple to offer sacrifice. And the Galileans were under Herod. And a group of soldiers from Pilate came and killed all of these people who had come to offer sacrifices so that their blood and the blood of their sacrifices was mingled together. Gross! Right? Now, if you recall at the end when Jesus is crucified, that Herod and Pilate become friends because before they were enemies. Remember reading that somewhere along the way? This is what happened, is they were enemies. And so the people who were under Herod go to make sacrifices, and they're killed by these Roman soldiers and there's so much blood that the sacrifices of the blood and the sacrifices of the people who were killed are mingled together. Now, here's the thing. They are killed in the process of doing something they were supposed to do. They weren't off sinning. They were offering sacrifice. And yet they are killed in the middle of doing what they were supposed to do. That doesn't seem fair, does it? As Steve Jobs would say, but wait, there's more. Verse 4 says, Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here's another horrible news of the day, right? There's a tower in Siloam, and it falls, and it kills 18 people. Now, here's the thing. Let me make that bad story worse for you. Are you ready? In John chapter 9, in case you think any of that sounds familiar, Jesus passes by, sees a blind man, and they say, uh, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents where he was born blind? I've preached out of this uh, scripture before. Um, and don't worry, I'm only going to preach one sermon today, I promise. So, in case some of you are going, huh, I need to get comfy because we're going to preach two sermons together. No, I'm going to preach one and then I'll be done. But he, he, he goes, look, you know, who sinned that this, that this guy is blind? And the disciples, uh, you know, of course, don't get it because his blindness is no one's fault. And Jesus says in verse 3, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Um, I, and then he says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's still day. Um, so he says, it's nobody's fault that this man is blind. 
So I'll just interject, not a whole sermon, but I will say, sometimes you go through stuff not because you did anything wrong, but because God wants to use you to show forth his glory. And we're so interested. I preached a couple weeks about this. We pray, God, get me out of this trial. God, get me out of this trial. What we should be preaching is, God, get me through this trial so that whatever you're trying to accomplish can be accomplished. And sometimes, a lot of times, we go through trials because we do stupid things. Me too. But sometimes God will put us into situations because he knows that we are spiritually mature enough to go through things so people can watch how we came through things and go, look what God did in their life. Who thought that this morning while Rocky was talking and said, look what God did in his life. And sometimes we go through things so that we can be a witness. But Rocky said, he said, I was in jail. And I wasn't in jail for something I did. Now, I know the whole story, and I know he ain't lying. Okay? Trust me on this one. Four years later, Rocky's pouring out his soul going, we need to reach those that are in jail. Why? Because Jesus said, I was in jail, and you came and visited me. Rocky, no, oh, feel the Holy Ghost. Rocky knows that when people are in that and they're in jail and they're separate from God and it seems like they're separate from everything they are, that's the people Jesus wants us to reach. And sometimes you go through things not because you did anything wrong, but because four years down the line, God's going, and I'm going to use that experience for you to minister to other people. And that's what was going on here in John chapter 9. Jesus said, Nobody sinned. This man was blind so that God's glory could be seen. So in the next verses it says, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man, and he said, go wash where? In the pool of Siloam. So he goes, washes in the pool of Siloam, and he's healed and all that, right? So if we go back, next slide. When he's talking about the Tower of Siloam, that Tower of Siloam is the portico of the very pool where this man washes. This is a place where people are healed. Not this day, though, because it falls over and kills 18 people in the same place where the guy in John chapter 9 was healed. 18 people get killed because the tower falls on them. And Jesus says they're blameless. He said, do you think they're worse sinners than anybody else? They're not. But it's a principle Jesus is trying to get across. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do, those, uh, do good to those who hate you, and pray to those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. What well, we tell people, somebody hates you, you pray for them. Hardest prayer there is, and you're going to pray it only in your flesh. Oh God, bless that person that I can't stand. Right? It's a tough prayer. Am I right? Yeah. But the Bible says it's like heaping coals on their head. You pray. And you'll pray it in your flesh, and you won't mean it, and that's okay. You'll just go, God bless them. Lord, I know they lied about me, and I know they used me, and I know that my life went in, you know, down the tubes because of what they said, and I want you to bless them. Now, a reasonable person would go, that's stupid, right? Amen. The Bible says you pray for those that spitefully use you. Let me, let me use a, a, a new living, those that hatefully use you, those that, that, that scheme against you, you pray for them. Why? Because when you pray in that in your flesh, God will start to change your heart. May do nothing for them. Probably will, though. But it'll change your heart. Here's why. The most quoted verse in Scripture, right? Not John 3, 16. It's what? Judge not, lest you be not judged, right? It doesn't say don't judge anybody. It says, but when you do, in the same measure you judge people, that's how you're going to be judged. I want to cut everybody slack because I want God to cut me slack. Amen? 
I want God to give me lots of mercy. And so I want to extend lots of mercy because I need that. So he says, it rains on the just and the unjust. Makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. What Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 5 is good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. Remember the book we talked about uh, last week, two weeks ago, it says when God doesn't make sense. How many know God doesn't make sense all the time? How many know right now things you're going through, God doesn't make sense? But God's still in control. And Jesus says in the first part of Luke chapter 13, he says, these people who were offering sacrifices and doing what they were doing and were killed, they're not sinners. They weren't being punished. He's just saying life happens. And he says, you're going to likewise perish unless you repent. People were at the pool of Siloam. The tower falls in, kills 18 people. And Jesus says, they weren't sinners, but you're going to likewise perish unless you repent. He underscores that life is unpredictable. And for that reason, we should always be in a state of repentance. Jesus says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Because life is short. And you don't know how much time you have on this rock. You don't. Here's what James says. James 4 and 13. Come now. You, uh, you who say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, I'll go do such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell, make a profit. Whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. James says life is like steam. It's here for a minute, and then it does, isn't. How many of you in the last six months have read or heard about someone's death and went, I cannot believe, right? I cannot believe that. They, I just saw them. I just heard from them. I knew them. I went to school with them. I went... The Bible tells us life is a vapor. We don't know how much time we have. So Jesus says, he says, people were killed offering sacrifices. People were killed at the pool of Siloam. And unless you repent, you're likewise going to perish. And then he comes to this parable in Luke chapter 13 and verse 6. It says, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Jesus has related two stories that we've read today uh, about recent events. He says these innocent people were killed offering sacrifices and these people were killed uh, at the Pool of Siloam, and he finishes both stories with a call to repentance. And then he goes to a parable, because these are all related. And he says, a certain man had a fig tree, and he cultivated it for three years, and he didn't produce any fruit. What Jesus is saying is it's not doing what it's designed to do. The master said, cut it down, it's just taking up space. Because the master apparently was all business. It's an interesting parable to follow the actual stories about the death of people and the need to repent. He says, for three years I've had this fig tree and it hasn't done what it's supposed to do. Cut it down and kill it. Here's an interesting thing. It takes fig trees three years to produce fruit. So it was just getting to where it was supposed to be productive. And I'm reading this, and I'm going, well, the master's a little quick on the trigger here, isn't he? But it wasn't doing what it was designed to do, and the master says, cut it down. Now the keeper of the vineyard intercedes in verse 8. But he answered and said to him, Sir, 
Let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilizer it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. The keeper asks for just a little more time for another space. He says, don't judge it on what you see now, but let me work on it some more. Let me tend to it. Let me show it some care. Let me work on this thing and see if we can not get it to do what it's made to do. And I say that, and I can feel it when Rocky was talking this morning, that some of you are hearing the voice yet this morning, and God's going, I'm not done with you yet. I know there's more in you. And that's the tale of one tree. Now, the other tree was the one we read about in our text, Mark chapter 11. Jesus went out, he saw the tree with figs, and he said, let no one eat feeds, figs on you, eat fruit from you again. Now, this isn't a parable, this is real life. It's a fig tree, it has no fruit, and the tree's not doing what it's supposed to do. And Jesus curses it. And there's no interceding, there's no time to make it better, and it's cursed. And the story picks up again in verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. There's two fig trees here. One is cursed and withers away. And the other one... The keeper intercedes and says, let me work on it some more. Let me work on it some more. Let me work on it some more. These two stories are related because the people who were righteous and died didn't have time to work on it some more. The people who were killed at the Tower of Siloam were killed, and they didn't have time to work on it some more. But we're here in God's house this morning and there is time to work on it some more. And God is calling each of us this morning to repentance. To go, God, if I'm not producing, if I'm not doing what you've called me to do, you keep working on me, and you change my heart, and you change my spirit, and you make me what you want me to be. You keep changing me this morning. Now, this is the part God added. How do I tell if he's still working on me? And Rocky walked all over my sermon with me. <laughs> because there is peace. When you know that you're walking in relationship with God, there is a peace, the Bible says, that passes understanding. There is a peace that you feel in your soul. And when you're not, when you're making the wrong decisions, it may feel fun and it may feel exhilarating, but it will never feel peaceful. You may go, this is a great, and I'm getting an adrenaline rush from it. Oh, we're having a good time. Do you feel peace? When the whole night is over and you lay down in your bed and it's just you and God, do you feel peace? Or is there something nugging at you, tugging at your spirit going, you're not living like you're supposed to be living. You're not doing what you were formulated to do. And the keeper keeps working it's going let me work with it let me make it what it's supposed to do there may be a thrill but there will never be peace peace is the sign God is working on us I have gone to my place uh, of devotion and I've told the church before that in the morning is my prayer and devotion time and I feel that peace going into my day. There are other times when I don't feel that peace. And that ought to be a red alert 
that I need to talk to God and get things right. I'm not trying to be condemning this morning. I'm just trying to say, look, if you don't feel the peace, the Bible says the peace that passes understanding, the Bible in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says he'll be called the Prince of Peace. If you don't feel peace about where you are, it's God working on you. He's trying to change you. Trying to make you what you're supposed to be. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. The first two words of that verse. Follow peace. The New King James says, pursue peace. In everything I do, I have learned that if I don't feel peace, I'm not in the will of God. I'm not living like I'm supposed to. And we've all had places, and I think Rocky was wonderfully transparent this morning. There are times when we are out of relationship with God. And, 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 and you may have fun. It may be exciting. It may be an adrenaline rush. But there will never be peace associated with it. Because only Jesus can give you peace. Amen? Let's stand this morning. I want us as a church to feel the peace of God. God, as I was talking, thinking about and putting these notes together, God said, you don't know. And I think of anything we've learned over the last six, seven months, we don't know what tomorrow holds. I have no idea. And Jesus said, this group was just living life, doing what they were doing, going about their business. And then their life was over. And this next group was doing what they were doing, going about their life, and then their life was over. And he puts on there, except you repent, you will likewise perish. I want to make sure that I am right with Jesus Christ. It is the most important thing in my life is that I am in relationship with Jesus. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, is not on the screen. It goes like this. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So God's trying to extend his grace to us. Don't turn it away. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. God has brought us to this place to work on us one more time. I am thankful that God has given me one more day to work on me and, 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 and uh, make me what I'm supposed to be and make me fulfill my purpose, and be more like him. And so I wonder if we can't, uh, wherever you're at in the congregation, just I want to reach out and we want to ask God, God, if I'm not where I'm supposed to be, change me and make me what I need to be. And let me feel the peace that passes understanding this morning. Will you do that? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you this morning. God, I pray right now that we would feel the peace that passes understanding. Lord, let your spirit move in this house and in this place right now. Lord, let it touch each of our hearts and minds. God, we have been given one more opportunity, Lord, to let you change and move and, and uh, uh, work on our spirits. I pray right now for each person here, God, that they would feel the peace that passes understanding, the peace of the Holy Ghost move in each life. God, if there is anything in our lives that would keep us from you, I ask that you would take it away, change it, transform our hearts and minds this morning. We need a touch of your spirit today. We love you, Jesus, and we give you praise this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I'm so glad you're here. Our guests, we're thrilled you're here this morning. We are the weirdest church in Ohio. And we're proud of it. Amen. So if you're a little odd, you found the right place. Hallelujah. We're uh, next week, dress casual like you do every week. 
and uh, we'll have soup and food and s'mores. I appreciate that. So I look forward to that next week. Before you go, I love every one of you, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. Give everyone a hug or a handshake or a chicken wing or whatever you want to do. God bless you. We'll see you next week.